Hi, I'm Huan Chinchen from UChicago. Our team, uh, led by Nick, uh, used blue waters to simulate cosmic ionization. And my project is to uh, model the galaxy formation uh, in the quasar proximity zones during ionization. So first, why do we uh, study ionization? So in the history of the universe, the gas experienced two major phase transition. At very first, after the Big Bang, everything is very hot, everything is ionized. But as the uh, universe expands and cooled, the proton recombine with the electron and form the neutral hydrogen. And uh, during this uh, so-called dark ages, uh, gravity slowly pulls stuff together and form the first objects like uh, stars, quasars, and gases, and the lights from these objects uh, re ionize the uh, gas again. So this uh, phase is called reionization. And this brought up about the second major phase transition from a mostly uh, neutral uh, universe to a mostly ionized universe. And this allows us to detect the most uh, distant objects because they ionize the gas, which is otherwise neutral and absorb the starlight. So there are a lot of uh, questions about this period. Uh, one of the biggest problems is that what drives this reionization? One uh, ma a mainstream answer to this question is that it is the galaxies. Um, people, uh, people have used the telescopes like the Hubble Space Telescope to study these uh, very distant uh, galaxies. So here I just show you some pretty pictures of them. So most of the galaxies you can see in the picture are actually from foreground, uh, uh, foreground galaxies and uh, the uh, galaxies in realization because they are very distant, you, you will have a hard time finding it. Uh, you need to use a very uh, uh, complicated me method. And although they look very faint, they are actually very bright galaxies uh, in that epoch of time. But, but uh, fortunately, we are entering a new era of JWST. So the JWST is the new flagship. Uh, which hopefully will be sent, uh, will be launched within two or three years. And NASA has uh, invested uh, more than $10 billion into this mission, and the primary science goal is to uh, study reionization. So the left, I show you the uh, relative size of the primary mirror of JWST as compared to the Hubble. And you can see that, that is uh, three times as large uh, aperture as the Hubble, and it offered us uh, unprecedented uh, sensitivity to probe fainter galaxies. On the right is a so-called luminosity function, basically the number of galaxies within certain uh, luminosity beams. So uh, Hubble can help us detect the very bright end, uh, but JWST will push this limit further, like three out of magnitude, and help us find many uh, fainter galaxies. And as the flood of uh, observational data come, come in, we, it's the right time for us to build some theoretic, uh, theoretic framework to interpret these data. Um, in fact, the, apart from the first galaxies, JWST will also study the, another very uh, interesting object, the uh, first quasars. So quasars are supermassive black holes. As they fast are creating the materials, it gave us uh, ultraluminous uh, radiation. And because they are very bright, they, these objects are another candidates to realize the universe. But the problem is that um, quasars are not as many as galaxies. So on, the, on this figure, I show the uh, luminosity function of both quasar and gassy, and you can see on the brighter end it's predominantly quasars, but in the uh, fainter end the, the luminosity function of quasar flattened out as compared to the galaxy. So, and also in this uh, fainter end we don't have uh, enough da data, so we have a lot of mysteries about these quasars. So, for example, how, what's their lifetime? or how long they can shine. This de determines the fold, uh, uh, number of photons per quasar can offer, and also what's their host halo. So most of the theorists uh, believe that these uh, 
quasars live in the most massive halos in realization. Uh, because the most massive halos are very rare, and if they all reside in the, those massive halos, the total number of quasars will be uh, significantly, significantly lower than if they reside in like in intermediate mass halos. Well, one way to um, help us constrain the mass of the quasar host halo is to map their surroundings. For example, counting the gases around them uh, because the more massive the uh, quasar host halo is, the more uh, dense the, total, the whole environment is. So here I show you some current observation. In the recent decades, there are a lot of observations, uh, similar observation, but this one is very recent one, uh, published last year by the Subaru team. So the uh, left figure is a quasar field, the right figure is a random field, and uh, in the center of the quasar field, the yellow one is the quasar, and the blue and the red uh, uh, data points are uh, galaxies found by different method. As you can uh, uh, notice that there actually are not as many uh, galaxies as that in random field. Um, but uh, we can't uh, draw immediately the conclusion that the quasar live in the under density because quasar have a very high uh, radi radiation and this radiation may heat the gas and uh, photo dissociate gas in other, qua uh, other gases. So, and this, uh, this can suppress the uh, gas to cool and form stars. So in order to constrain the mass of uh, a quasar host halo, we need to understand how this quasar feedback may uh, impact the gas formation. But this problem is, uh, uh, to theoretically model this question is pretty uh, computational challenging because we have a large dynamic range. The approximated zoom is like 30 megaparsec, and to resolve galaxies, we need 100 megaparsec, uh, so that's a lot of fine uh, dynamic range. To uh, reduce the cost in this side, we use our R code, which is uh, adapt adaptive mesh refinement code, and to do to uh, model this uh, problem, I need a thousand root grids and seven levels of refinement. Also, uh, we have uh, we need to model different physical processes, like, uh, for example, dark matter, which drives the uh, large-scale uh, structure formation, and we need to model gas, and also we need to include the atomic processes and the radiative transfer to calculate the temperature of the gas and the uh, uh, ionic uh, fraction of this gas. And last but, but not least, we need to use the star formation and stellar feedback subgrid model to actually get the star particles and to calculate the synthetic uh, obser ob observables. So in our, uh, computer, uh, in our simulation, all these uh, different uh, physical processes are c all coupled together, and so it's very uh, computationally expensive, especially the radiation transfer. And for one hydro step, we need to at least uh, iterate uh, 30 RT steps. So uh, one simulation costs more than 20,000 uh, node hours, and to save all this uh, simulation data, we need one terabyte per snapshot. And so we really need blue waters. And thankfully, we get the allocation, and I was able to run a suite of simulation with different uh, quasar parameters. So here I just show you some of the uh, simulations. So plotted here is the, are the uh, 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 neutral hydrogen fraction. So the left one is the uh, simulation without quasar. So th this is a slide through the most massive halo in the box. And as you can see, because the uh, uh, massive gases are clustered together, there are a lot of uh, uh, ionization bubbles clustered together. And in the Middle panel and the uh, right panel, I put our radiation source in this most massive halos and let it shine for a, a certain, like in this simulation, I ran it for thir uh, 300 million years. So this is 
uh, I plot here is the one that runs uh, like uh, 30 million years, I guess. And you can also see how, how uh, the dynamic range we achieve, so from all the uh, quasar proximity zone uh, till the uh, every uh, galaxies. So first, uh, so from this uh, simulation, we can get a lot of science out of it. So first, I, what I want to show is the uh, environmental difference of star formation. So without radiation, so that, that so let's first focus on the one without ra radiation. So the left of panel, I choose the or the low mass halo within this black circle, very close to the quasar, and and I plot the star formation history of these halos. So the x axis is the time and the Y axis the stellar mass, and you can see the so this green curve is or is the average of the stellar mass at every time for all these small mass halos in this circle, and as a comparison, the dashed line I plot all the uh, halos outward the dashed circle, and you can find that. Uh, for the halos away from the, far away from the quasar, the uh, star formation time is like delayed. And that is because in the outer region, the uh, materials are not dense enough to form star that early. So then we want to understand how quasar may impact this uh, star formation history. So here I plot the same thing, but for this uh, simulation with, with quasar. So in the uh, gray vertical line, I turn the quasar on, and we, we can see that suddenly the star formation got uh, stopped, uh, suppressed, got suppressed, and got suppressed right away, and, uh, and the physical mechanism is measured by uh, photo dissociation of the molecular uh, hydrogen. And the one that for the halos outs outside of the dash line, the degree of suppression is very small because the uh, radiation field is less intense. And so finally, I want to show you the imprints on the luminosity function. So first, uh, the, the right is the bright end. So for the, at the bright end, we can see that the quasar radiation doesn't impact the uh, luminosity function uh, significantly, but at the fan end, the quasar radiation can uh, suppress the uh, number by uh, around 50 percent. Uh, however, this, uh, this uh, suppression is not as, as nearly as uh, comparable as the field-to-field -field, uh, variation. So here I plot a same luminosity function, but choose a random field. And we can see that the, the difference is f far larger than the difference caused by the uh, quasar uh, radiation. So I think my time is over. And so here I show the summary. And so JWST will uh, give us a lot of, of, us a lot of uh, observational data about the quasar gases in ionization. And using the 3D cosmological simulations, uh, we can understand a lot about the gas formation around quasar. And so three takeaway from uh, the result I show today. So star formation history varies with distance to quasar, and the quasar radiation can suppress star formation in low mass halos. And also quasar radiation leaves a small imprints on the faint end of the galaxy luminosity function. And with this uh, suite of simulation, I'm also making synthetic spectrum and trying to study what kind of physical quantity about the quasar, about the IgM, IgM can I uh, recover from this synthetic spectrum. So there are lots of fun ahead. Thank you.